In this lecture, we're going to contrast the Chesapeake and New England colonies of the 17th century. And the Chesapeake colonies developed very differently than the New England colonies. In New England, the nuclear family, that is father, mother, children, uh, served as the basic building block of society. They saw the family as a God-ordained institution. The New England was a very patriarchal society in that men ruled everything. We saw that with the expulsion of Anne Hutchison. And unless you were a member of one of these nuclear families, you really didn't have a place in this society. The Great Migration of 1630s and 1640s brought a lot of new settlers to New England, Puritans and others, uh, but it, it, New England began to gain in population rapidly. And historians have discussed in the past whether it was survival or fertility that increased the population of New England. In other words, are they having more children because the Puritans did tend to have a lot of children in each family? Uh, they had to in order to help out with the family farm, things like that. Or was it survival? Were they living longer? Well, actually, it's more survival than fertility. The lifespan of New Englanders at this time was easily 70 or 80 years old, comparable with the lifespan of modern Americans. And so they're living longer, living much longer. You can see here a painting of an idyllic New England village in the 17th century. Now, in terms of marriage, marriage occurred young in 17th century New England society, especially by modern standards. Typically, women were expected to marry by the ages of 16, 17, or 18. For men, it was a bit older, 20 or 21. Uh, typically, of course, they expected men to be able to support a family before they got married. That's why the marriage age was a little bit older for men. Historians have estimated that a New England family at this time would have needed to own 75 acres as a farm, as a minimum for survival, in order to grow crops and support themselves uh, both in terms of sustenance and economically. And these nuclear families made up congregational churches. And again, congregationalism was the, the ruling religion at that time, uh, Puritanism, and everything went through these local congregations. And the Puritans put a great deal of importance on education, not just so they could read the Bible, although that was a key, uh, a key reason for their emphasis on education, but also so they could hold better town meetings, just in general for the betterment of society. And so in New England, you easily had literacy rates that were 70% of adults that were literate, far higher than England at this time. And so... They put a great emphasis on education. You can see a Puritan family here on the right and on the lower right-hand side, an image of an open Bible. One of the things that grew out of this Puritan emphasis on education was the founding of the, the college that later became known as Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1636. It was a Puritan a uh, preacher named John Harvard, who on his deathbed made a huge bequest to the university, and so they renamed it Harvard College after him in 1638. And then in 1701, uh, the Connecticut State Assembly, the Connecticut Colonial Assembly, excuse me, uh, created a college which was moved to New Haven, Connecticut in 1716. And in 1718, when Cotton Mather, the Puritan minister, asked for help supporting the college, an English merchant named Elihu Yale sent him a little over 400 books and goods that were worth 800 pounds sterling. So they eventually renamed the college Yale after Elihu Yale. Uh, 
it's important to understand how much the transatlantic slave trade funded these universities. Harvard, the oldest institution of higher learning in the United States, and Yale, the third, the third oldest institution of higher learning in the United States. At Harvard, funds from the slave trade literally funded the first degrees in law. Uh, Elihu Yale was a noted slave trader. And so from the beginning, the proceeds of the transatlantic slave trade funded the building of the educational system in the United States. Now, in terms of rank and status in 17th century New England, it was a very hierarchical society. That is, there were definite uh, places in society, but there was a high degree of social mobility. I mean, some of the men who came over, like John Winthrop, they were not prominent in England at all, but ended up becoming the leaders of these colonies. And there was high social mobility because there was a relatively small wealth gap between the wealthiest New Englanders and the poorest New Englanders at this time, relatively small, especially compared to today. In general, for young men, there were two tracks open to them in terms of careers. You could either become a subsistence farmer, probably like your father had been, or you could go into an apprenticeship. You could apprentice yourself to a master craftsman in order to learn a trade. Um, there were a few select who, of course, would go to Harvard and Yale. Harvard and Yale started accepting students as young as 14 or 15. Of course, those colleges were all male at that time. So you could go to Harvard or Yale, become a preacher, perhaps a lawyer. But most, the vast majority of New England young men became either subsistence farmers or apprentices. When you were an apprentice, you could apprentice yourself to a... Uh, a cooper, a cooper makes barrels. Uh, you could apprentice yourself to uh, make horseshoes. There's uh, to be a, a blacksmith. There's any number of way of things that you could apprentice yourself. Silversmith, and of course, after you did a certain amount of time uh, studying under the master craftsman, you could open your own uh, practice, providing those services to the community. On the left, you can see a New England family. At this time, the mother, of course, helping one of the daughters learn to read. Women were expected to have a basic level of education, although men were favored. Uh, and women were expected to have a basic level of education, if nothing else, than to be able to give their children a basic education. The world of the Chesapeake in the 17th century differed dramatically from that of New England. First of all, you had a lack of nuclear families moving across the Atlantic. Mainly, they're moving as individuals. Uh, out of the initial 120,000 uh, colonists to the Chesapeake area, 90,000 of them were indentured servants. And so indentured servants, uh, typically the term of indenture was five years. But if you were under 15, the term of indenture was seven years. Now, for the sons of the wealthy, for the sons of the tobacco planters in the Chesapeake, uh, the King William III did actually issue letters establishing the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia in 1693. Uh, that makes William and Mary the second oldest institution of higher learning in what is now the United States. Still around today, of course. In the Chesapeake, there was a very high mortality rate, though. Life expectancy of 43 for men, much younger for women, and there were very, very few women in the Chesapeake, uh, English women, that is. Um, before 1700, it was six and a half men for every one woman on average in the Chesapeake. Even after 1700, it's still like four and a half to one, so still not great odds. This gave women greater social leverage. They could choose whom they wanted to marry, etc. Uh, but, of course, these women often did not live very long. They died in childbirth. They died of yellow fever. And so, just in general, very, very different society than that of New England. As far as rank and status in the Chesapeake, rank and status revolved around tobacco. If you were a tobacco planter, you were one of the a small group of social elites. And there was a very sharp wealth gap in the Chesapeake at this time. Now, of course, tobacco planters purchased indentured servants in large numbers. 
until the last couple decades of the 17th century, and then they began purchasing enslaved Africans. And we'll talk about why when we talk about Bacon's Rebellion in the next lecture. In the 1680s, there was a dramatic increase in life expectancy. They began building towns and villages up out of the swamp bottoms of the, of the Chesapeake. So as the life expectancy increased, there was a sharp drop in social mobility. In other words, socially, it was relatively easy to move up if you were able to survive because it wouldn't be long before someone died and they had to leave that property to someone. And so the Virginia elites of the 18th and 19th century, the vast majority of them were descended from indentured servants. Uh, because of the rural nature of the Chesapeake, there was little incentive to develop schools or towns. Uh, literacy rate was much lower in the Chesapeake than it was in New England. Uh, you can see here a tobacco field today, and on the bottom right, indentured servants harvesting tobacco. As far as the beginnings of African slavery in the English colonies, uh, one of the major organizations encouraging enslaved, in, encouraging the purchasing and importation of enslaved Africans was the Royal African Company, which was founded by uh, King Charles II in 1672. Of course, uh, his brother, the Duke of York, James II, had a lot to do with it as well. Uh, the early list of investors and stockholders in this company is, is a veritable who's who of the English nobility we've been talking about from Sir George Carteret all the way to John Locke were all heavily involved with the Royal African Company. And so most enslaved Africans arrived in the English colonies after 1700. And the decision to import African slaves was economic. In other words, historians have debated whether racism predated slavery or whether slavery predated racism in the colonies, and it actually appears uh, to a large degree that slavery predated racism. And then, of course, in order to justify slavery, they created many of the racist paradigms that had lasting impact. The status of the enslaved under law was largely codified after 1700, by and large, and the slave codes became harsher as the numbers of enslaved increased and the fear of rebellions increased. The upper left hand court, you can see an artist's depiction of the below decks of a slave ship. And on the bottom left, an artist's depiction of a Chesapeake planter uh, attempting to coerce a woman by holding her child away from her. As far as African-American culture in English America, the experience differed dramatically depending on where you were enslaved. If you were enslaved in New York City, you typically were a personal servant to a wealthy white family. If you were enslaved in the Boston area, you might be a personal servant waiting on students at Harvard. Uh, if you were in the middle colonies, typically you worked alongside a white family, no less harsh, but still a different experience than living on a large plantation, tobacco plantation in the Chesapeake, or a rice plantation uh, in Georgia or South Carolina. And so the experience just differed dramatically. Again, no less terrible from place to place, but different roles, different numbers. After 1700, birth rates began exceeding death rates and began a natural increase in the population of the enslaved, so that by 1860, 160 years later, you had 4 million enslaved African Americans in the United States. The Stono Uprising of 1739 in South Carolina was the first major slave rebellion in North America, and it began with a literate enslaved African man probably from the Kingdom of Congo, named Cato, or Jemmy. He's known as Cato in some sources and Jemmy as others. And Cato had learned that if they were able to make it to Spanish Florida, that they would be free. And Cato also learned, because he was 
literate in Portuguese, English, probably Spanish as well, he had learned that they were about to change the law in South Carolina to require white men to carry firearms seven days a week, not just six days a week, so carry firearms on Sunday as well. And so he decided the time to act was now. And on Sunday, September 9th, 1739, Sundays typically were days when enslaved Africans could gather. He assembled a group of men. They may have been soldiers uh, in their native Congo in Central Africa. Uh, there were about 20 of them. And they uh, raised the flag that had the word liberty on it, chanting in unison. On the way, they marched south towards Spanish Florida. They gathered more recruits. They had a total of 81 men. They burned six plantations, killed 23 to 28 whites along the way. And the next day, a well-armed white mounted militia caught up with the groups uh, near the uh, Edisto River. And in the ensuing confrontation, 23 whites and 47 Africans were killed. And they, the colonists executed most of the rebels after they were defeated. And they sold others off to the markets of the Caribbean. Of course, Cato himself, or Jemmy, was executed. After... The, in the aftermath, South Carolina passed the Slave Act of 1740. It required a ratio of one white to ten Africans on any plantation. The law prohibited slaves from growing their own food, assembling groups, earning money, or learning to read. And it also put a ten-year moratorium on importing any new Africans because they were thought to be more rebellious. The the site of where the rebellion began, Hutchison's Warehouse on the Stono River, where the re rebels stole munitions and arms, was actually declared a National Historic Landmark in 1974. And so even though they only got 15 miles, Cato and his followers left an indelible imprint on the history of the South and on the history of South Carolina. And this South Carolina slave code stayed in place all the way until the outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861.